if we, the people and churches of this diocese, become clear, passionate and determined about that most privileged work of sharing Jesus for life, we will be transformed and revitalised. Now that is a huge claim. Do I have that much confidence in our strategic plan and its implementation? Am I overconfident in my leadership as bishop? A firm no to both of those. My confidence is in the power of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. My confidence is in the convicting power of the Holy Spirit who testifies about Jesus and will convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. My confidence is in Jesus, the one mediator between God and humankind who gave himself as a ransom for all people. My confidence is in our great God who wants all people to be saved and come to a saving knowledge of the truth. My confidence is in you, the clergy and people of this diocese, who are increasingly clear that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And my confidence is in our churches, who share the devotion of the Acts 2 church to teaching, to one another, to hospitality, and to prayer. So may it be that we too enjoy the favour of all the people and the Lord adds to our number those who are being saved. When the gospel is clearly lived out and proclaimed, when the Holy Spirit does his convicting work and when people grasp the mediating work of Jesus, When God our Father draws people to himself, when we obey our calling and become devoted to all that the Acts 2 church was devoted to, then we ourselves, our churches and our diocese will be transformed and revitalised. What might hinder this transformation and revitalisation? The evil one. God in his word is absolutely clear that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are warned to keep alert and to be of sober mind for our enemy the devil loves to go around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We are exhorted to resist him by standing firm in the faith. How might the evil one derail our transformation and revitalisation? Through unbelief. If you don't really believe that those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord, then you will not be motivated to share Jesus with others. Unbelief will lead to inaction and apathy, and quite probably in the end, outright opposition to the cause of making Christ known. (coughs) How might the evil one derail our transformation and revitalisation? By ensuring that we keep looking back. Back to tradition. If you are more attached to and committed to maintaining tradition... Then to seeing people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, you will be a hindrance to the work of sharing Jesus for life. Jesus didn't mince words about those committed to man-made traditions. He called them hypocrites and, quoting the prophet Isaiah, taught that such people honoured God with their lips while their hearts were far from him. He said, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Friends, the evil one will hinder the work of the gospel as people cling to traditions which either cloud the gospel, weigh people down, hold the church back, 
or are totally foreign to non-church people. So the evil one will delight to keep people looking back to tradition. He will also hinder our work by ensuring people cling on to past hurts. The evil one would love you to keep clinging to the hurts of the past. That building that was sold, that financial decision, that trust fund raided. If you can't let go of those past hurts, you will find no joy in moving forward with the work of the gospel. And yet we are exhorted so clearly to get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. We are urged to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. It seems to me that you can't live out those exhortations at the one and the same time as clinging on to past hurts. We must, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present our requests to God and take all our hurts to him. Only as we do that will his peace, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So the evil one will want us to keep looking back to tradition, back to past hurts, and back to conflict. Conflict past and present will derail the work of the gospel. Again, we need to hear God's exhortation. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. We need to hear this and put it into practice. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So the evil one will hinder the work of sharing Jesus for life through unbelief, through ensuring you keep looking back, and thirdly, through distraction. By making secondary causes look like they're the main thing. I think the evil one is big on distraction. And it is so subtle because there are many other causes which can seem worthy of our attention. Climate change, refugee advocacy, reconciliation, many other social issues can seem to some to be what the church should be on about. Of course these are all important issues in our world today. And there are good ways Christians can contribute to these areas. Because we understand our responsibility to care for God's world. Because we understand the plight of the outsider, because we understand that reconciliation is central to the gospel. However, if secondary issues become primary, with the result that sharing Jesus for life is dropped down the list of what is important, then sharing Jesus will simply not happen. Unjust structures in society will not primarily change through the advocacy of Christians or other interest groups. But when people's hearts are changed and softened by Jesus and the transforming work of the Spirit, if the evil one can keep us away from sharing Jesus for life by other things which look to be as important or more important than the work work of the gospel, is hindered or derailed. Distraction too by issues in the wider Anglican Church. Some of you will know about a number of issues being dealt with by the wider Anglican Church of Australia. I'm sure the evil one would be delighted if I spent a lot of time in this address on all of those issues. But they are a distraction. I shared at the bishops' meeting in Adelaide in March that we will never understand the reasons that we differ on marriage until we have wrestled with those more fundamental differences about which we never speak. The authority of the Bible, the nature of salvation, judgment, the meaning of the death of Christ, the resurrection, the nature of Holy Communion, the significance of preaching, etc. 
So yes, there are significant theological and ecclesiastical differences between bishops in Australia. However, if we allow those issues to become agenda items for us here when they are not currently issues, then as significant as they might be for the wider church, they will just take us away from sharing Jesus for life and consume much time and energy. We are one of 23 dioceses in the Anglican Church of Australia and we value all that is good about our life together with the other 22. But we ought not to allow some of those sad divisions and differences between some of those dioceses and their bishops to distract us or keep us from sharing Jesus for life. For we are completely free to pursue our own agenda and nothing should distract us from what is most critical and most important for our future together. Well, we've looked at my, what might hinder our transformation and revitalisation. Primarily the work of the evil one through unbelief, through looking back and by distraction. What then might accelerate our transformation and revitalisation? The flip side. Conviction, looking forward, and focus. First, conviction. Members of Synod, are you convicted that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Are you convicted that all, uh, that all are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus? That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord? That this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That in the past God looked, overlooked ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That because we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. That Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And that our message as Christ's ambassadors is, be reconciled to God. Are you convicted by all those things? I am are you hold fast to these convictions grasp your convictions prioritize your convictions live your convictions let nothing sway you from them and allow them to shape your life and the life of your church the second factor that will help accelerate our transformation and revitalization is a determination to keep looking forward Looking forward to Jesus. Sharing Jesus brings many challenges. Making this your church's aim and focus will not be easy. You will, focus, you will face opposition from within the church, from outside the church, and from spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But the clear exhortation from God, as seen in Hebrews 12, is that we must run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. How will that help? Jesus endured massive hardship and opposition all the way to the cross, and yet he endured. As we fix our eyes on him, his perseverance will inspire ours. He kept going through trials because he knew the joy that was to come. If we consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinners, then we will not grow weary or lose heart. So looking forward, looking forward to Jesus, but also looking forward to connecting with missing generations. That is, eagerly anticipate welcoming families, children and young people to your church and work to make that happen. We are seeing this happen now at the 10am service at the cathedral. We are seeing it evolve in Millthorpe and Dubbo and Forbes and Parks and in the Ova Church in Mudgee. Capture the vision of seeing families return. 
Invite your children or grandchildren back to church. Explore the possibilities of a mum's group or mainly music. Use this coming Christmas to run a contemporary carol service in a relaxed way. Establish a partnership with a Sydney church who might come and help with a holiday kids club. Contact Scripture Union to see how they may help. Do whatever you can through the SRE opportunity. So keep looking forward. Forward to Jesus. Forward to making new connections. And forward to investing in eternity. Some people have stopped or reduced their giving to the local church. I understand the reservations. The diocese made poor financial decisions. Funds were raided for the CBA court case and redress. I want to assure you that there is new leadership and safety measures and greater transparency than ever before in the life of our diocese to make sure that past mistakes cannot be repeated. If we are going to rebuild the work, we need well-trained gospel workers to come and lead us and equip us and we need to support them financially to do that work. We need people, as I commented earlier, to let go of past hurts and look forward to the future. Your generosity now to support a local minister or ministers in the work of the gospel will make a difference now and for eternity. And should you find you are able to leave something by way of bequest to the diocese, what a wonderful way of supporting the work going forward after you've gone to glory. What a wonderful way of investing in eternity. So stand firm on your convictions, keep looking forward, and finally maintain an unswerving focus. Focus on sharing Jesus for life. If we work on keeping the main thing the main thing, then sharing Jesus for life will become the filter or grid by which we weigh up and evaluate all our activities. Has your parish or parish council spent time yet looking at the strategic plan? Have you identified aspects of the plan you can embrace or adapt for your local context? Have you asked what activities among everything the parish is doing actually helps us share Jesus? Have you considered what activities you're currently doing hinder the work or distract from the work of sharing Jesus by taking valuable resources in people, time, energy, money, which by any evaluation does not help the task of sharing Jesus? Have you considered using the catchphrase for your own parish? And redesigning your artwork so that sharing Jesus for life becomes what more consciously and purposefully drives your parish's planning and ministry and becomes part of your DNA. Focus on sharing Jesus for life and planning to share Jesus for life. Don't just focus on it as a concept, but actually plan to do it. Some parishes, such as Narromine, have already had four or five planning meetings and they've launched their own adaptation of the plan. That is, they've taken three or four things from the front page and put them on the back page so that's what we're going to give our efforts to. One Bible study group for the whole parish has turned into four Bible study groups for the whole parish as a result of the strategic plan. How good is that? They've already run a community seminar called Evidence for Belief where 70 people gathered from far and wide and after which three people became Christians. Your parish doesn't need a minister or even a lot of people or resources to make use of key elements of the plan. Your church may decide, for example, from the first column of the strategic plan, to minimise formality and ritual to effectively communicate the gospel to a contemporary world. That will mean that when that young family walks in because they're new to town and they're checking you out, they may just come back next week because the service wasn't completely foreign to them. You might decide from the second column of the plan to work on clear, relevant prayers and Bible readings and songs that are Jesus-centred and gospel-focused. So you might watch Beck Choi's presentation from last year's conference on writing prayers. Ask someone to train your Bible readers to read more clearly 
and ask Kevin Simington's help to provide some music for more contemporary songs. All of that will help your prayers not be too long, your Bible readings clear, and your songs Bible-based and Jesus-focused. And that, such small things, will make a difference. And from the third column of the plan, you might decide to speak to me about developing and promoting resources to to facilitate daily Bible reading and prayer. That will make a difference in your church life as people take more delight in God's word and spending time with him in prayer. As a result, people will grow in their relationship with God and as they grow in their relationship with God, they will become more passionate about sharing Jesus for life. Sometimes, friends, it is just small things which are missing in some of our churches which will make a huge difference. Brothers and sisters, for over 150 years, the gospel has been proclaimed under the banner of the Diocese of Bathurst. There have been some sad, hard even distressing times in our history, including recent times. But faithful people have toiled long and hard with an understanding that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. I believe we are seeing God at work in a new chapter. There were over 100 people at the Diocesan Conference at the end of July when the strategic plan was launched. How good was that? There were over 90 people at the diocesan camp at Ridgecrest a month ago from across all age groups and many parishes represented. In the last close now to three years, 14 people from outside the diocese have been appointed to ministry roles and nine people ordained. At the time of writing, three appointments have recently been announced and two further appointments will be made tomorrow. And two further possibilities are under discussion. That means that 16 out of 26 parishes without ministers just two months ago may in fact be 10 without ministers by the end of the year. We now have a strategic plan. We know where we're heading. And we have a wise, good, compassionate God and Father who is even more interested in the work of the gospel flourishing than we are. If we, the people and churches of this diocese, become clear and passionate and determined about that most privileged work of sharing Jesus for life, we will be transformed and revitalised. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us that same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.